Okay. For those who might be a guest today, let me explain to you where you find our church this morning. We are closing in on the end of what we call the Jesus season. This is a period of time between Christmas and Good Friday and Easter when our church focuses exclusively on the person of Jesus himself. That means we read through a gospel together. In fact, on the front of your leaflet, you will see what the weekly chapters are that we are reading this week. As it happens this year, I'm teaching through the Gospel of Matthew specifically. Uh, I teach on something that you're going to read about in the next week if you read those couple of chapters. Uh, Did you notice, if you're reading through the Gospel of Matthew, did you notice how fast the Gospel of Matthew got to the last week of Jesus' life. One-third of the Gospel of Matthew is devoted to the last week of Jesus' life. Those events immediately preceding his death and resurrection. All of the Gospels in your New Testament work that way. The Gospel of John has even more than half of its Gospel devoted to this last week of Jesus' life. Interesting that they move so quickly to the end. And it's because what happens at the end really tells you a lot about what Jesus was all about and why things came to a head the way that they did. Because we, in our reading, have already made it to the last week of Jesus' life, let's talk about something that you're going to encounter this week in your reading. It's actually something you've seen thus far already, too, in your reading. And it actually is a fairly simple question and a very important one for those of us who call ourselves Christians because it's one that's very central to our faith. Um, Why did Jesus die? What are the explanations that you have heard for why Jesus has died? Uh, If you're a Christian person, most of the time, the way you will hear that explained to you is that Jesus died, quote, for our sins, unquote. And that is a thoroughly biblical phrase, one taken right from the pages of Scripture itself, uh, namely mostly from the writings of the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letters in your New Testament from Romans to Philemon, the bulk of your New Testament. Why did Jesus die? Here's an intriguing thing about the Christian faith, uh, one that Philip Yancey in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew, observed. He once took a trip to India, and on a spare morning on his trip, he walked around the very large city uh, where he was. And he encountered uh, the worship centers of all the different major faiths or world religions in India. First, he saw a Muslim mosque, which if you've ever seen one, is very austere and simple, lacks a lot of decor. And then he wandered by a Buddhist temple, which is quiet and reflective and meditative. And then he walked by a Hindu temple. And a Hindu temple is almost the exact opposite of a Buddhist temple. All kinds of colors, all kinds of statues to gods, all different kinds of gods, all different kinds of songs and noises and sacrifices and incense. And then he ran into a church, a Christian church, a fairly dilapidated wooden building there in India. And the only adornment on this church was a simple wooden cross on its roof. And there in this city in India, Philip Yancey wondered to himself, I wonder why it was that Christians settled on that symbol for our faith. He thinks to himself, why didn't we pick something associated with the resurrection? The resurrection is far more hopeful and joyful and positive. Why didn't we think to do that? have the symbol, the universal symbol of our faith, be something associated with Easter, not Good Friday. But there is something about the cross and the meaning of the cross that Christian people for 2,000 years now have always gravitated to. 
There is something about why Jesus had to die that is so moving and touching to us. And the truth is, your Bible has more than one answer to that question. It depends on who you ask. Each one of the authors in your New Testament looks at it a little different. Not in a way that conflicts with the others, but in a way that's distinct from the others. In fact, for those of you who have been around River Tree for a while, you might remember a couple years ago, we talked about how the Gospel of John looks at the cross of Jesus. And he doesn't even have just one way. He has six or eight ways that he understands the death of Jesus. This morning, what I want to do is introduce you to a way that the Gospel of Matthew, that you will find in your reading this week, understands the death of Jesus. It's a way that Jesus himself understood his own death and why it was so important and what it means to us. And then hopefully that will help you begin to understand why it should be so meaningful for you and for I. Uh, here are some verses oops, that you have already encountered in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, has the distinction of being the first time in Matthew's Gospel that Jesus predicts his own death. Now what I want you to do is look at that passage up on the screen and pick out what's kind of unique or distinct about why Jesus said he had to die. First, please note, what doesn't it say? That he had to die for our sins. Right? That's okay. I already told you, different authors in the Bible can say things in different ways or distinct ways, in complementary ways. What's unique about this? Matthew says, Jesus speaking, that from that time forward in the middle of his ministry, about a year before the events of Good Friday, give or take, he was telling his followers that he had to go to Jerusalem and he had to undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and then be killed and then on the third day rise again. What's unique about that? It's the who. It's not the what. Other writers in your New Testament tell you that Jesus had to die. What Matthew tells you here in the words of Jesus is who was going to do it. And it was going to be the Jewish leaders. The leaders of the faith in which Jesus himself resided. Jesus was a Jew by birth and choice. And it was the leaders of that faith who were going to kill Jesus. And Jesus knew it. Here, by the way, is the third time in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus predicts his own death. And please notice he gives the very same explanation. The Son of Man, meaning himself, Jesus, has to go to Jerusalem when he will be handed over to those Jewish leaders and they will condemn him to death. And they'll even give him over to the Roman or Gentile rulers, etc., etc. You see it? So see, from the perspective of the Gospel of Matthew, here is one of the reasons Jesus had to die. And in this case, Jesus himself knew it. What Jesus understood is that he was on a collision course, an unalterable collision course with the powers that be. And by the middle of his public life, his teaching, his ministry, his work, he knew that it was going to be unavoidable. You ever been in a car wreck? where you have had this same sort of thing happen, where you've experienced this. It was just a couple of winters ago that I was a casualty of a three-car pileup on 28th Street in Granville when two cars in front of me piled into one another, and then my beloved Vibe, the best car I've ever owned, was the third car in a three-car pileup. And it was one of those things that I could see coming. It was in the dead of winter, ice on the roads, you know the story. It happens all the time. All of you who are Michiganders go, gosh, when are we going to learn how to drive in snow in cases like that? Well, I was one of those people you were talking about this day two years ago. And I could see it coming. Those two guys in front of me slammed on their brakes. The second one ran into the first one. And I had at least 50 yards to think to myself, can I stop? No, I cannot stop right now. And so I threw my hands up in the air because I didn't want the uh, airbag to deploy and sprain or break my wrists. And I just waited 
for my tiny little vibe that's about two centimeters off the ground to run under the front end of this huge Escalade in front of me. Uh, by the way, which doesn't make your airbag deploy. So I almost died without the airbag deploying. I think that what Jesus sensed in Matthew 16 and Matthew 20 is exactly what I sensed that day on 28th Street in Granville in the dead of winter. He saw what was coming. He saw the collision that was coming. And he knew it was unavoidable. He knew that it was going to cost him his life. See, Jesus came not to alter or tweak the religious system around him. He did, not can't, he did not come to turn the page and offer another chapter or the next chapter in this religious system around him. He came to break it. He came to break it and put something new in its place. He came to confront it and defy it and obliterate it. And he knew that by doing so, by speaking so forcefully and candidly about the religion around him, it was ultimately going to cost him his life. Because he knew how threatened the powers that be were going to be by him. Jesus had to die in order to break the system in which he lived. And see, this is actually part of the Bible's perspective on Jesus' death that human beings in general don't have a hard time understanding. Not just Christian people, but all of us. Why is it that movies like the Matrix aren't just popular but end up being cultural phenomenon where they strike a chord with the culture at large and oftentimes people will tell you gosh you know I remember when I saw that and I remember how that affected me well in the case of those movies you know why because it's talking about the same thing that we all fundamentally sense there are powers and forces at play in our culture and in the world around us that are bigger than any one person. They are bigger than any one time and place. They're even bigger than any country on the globe at any given time. They are universal, deeply seated issues in the human race and in human history. And we get that we feel like little peons facing up against those Goliaths. We sense that there is a system in place. Here's how the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says that. He recognizes and passes on to those believers that our fight is not against flesh and blood. That means other human beings. But it is against authorities and rulers and, he says, even spiritual powers in the present age and evil spiritual forces in the heavenly places. He recognizes that there are forces at play in the world that simply outlast and outsize us. This is why you can land anywhere on the globe and you will find things like injustice. You will find things like prejudice. You will find things like a lack of forgiveness. You will find things like oppression, or you'll find some of the things that we're going to talk about in a moment. These are universal human phenomenon, a system that holds us in place. Jesus saw that, and Jesus knew it was going to cost him his life to throw himself against it and to establish something different. When you hear Jesus described as a revolutionary, this is why. This week, you're going to get a chance to read when all of this comes to a head. That moment of impact between the car in which Jesus is driving and the car in front of him. And it's Matthew chapter 23. The entire chapter is devoted to Jesus losing his mind at the Pharisees and Jewish leaders in the last week of his life. This is Jesus so mad, he's peeling paint off the walls. This is bazooka Jesus. This is demolition derby Jesus. It is one of the most unvarnished moments that you will have seeing Jesus angry and unabated in his confrontation of the system 
around him. I want to show you some of what you're going to encounter in Matthew chapter 23. Just two examples of what could be many of the system that Jesus came to confront. These are Jesus' words hurled at the Jewish leaders of his day. Verses 23 and 24 of that chapter, Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Obviously, he's read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. For you tithe, or give 10%, of your mint, dill, and cumin. Yes, those are household spices. The chef in me goes, gosh, I wonder how those three spices would work together. I don't know, they seem a little weird. You tithe mint, dill, and cumin but you have neglected the weightier matters of the Scripture or Old Testament like justice and mercy and faith. It is these that you ought to have practiced without forgetting the others. You blind spiritual guides, you strain out a gnat and you swallow a camel. Now there is Jesus turning a fantastic phrase. You swallow a gnat, and you strain out a gnat, and yet you swallow a camel. What is Jesus' issue with the religious system in place in his day? And you might even say in ours, or that it has always existed in human history. The ills of the religions that we tend to put in place over us. Well, in the case of these two verses, it's fairly clear. If you want to rubberneck with me at the Jesus-Pharisee pile-up that's about to occur in the Gospel, here's one of the reasons it happens. Because Jesus is tired of a spirituality that makes a lot out of little things and makes too little out of the big things. And he stares down the religious leaders in the last week of his life and says, this to me is my issue with you. Now use the image in your mind and imagine what Jesus wants us to see. His image is that these people were teaching a way of spirituality that was so meticulous, fastidious, and detail-oriented that they would make sure that they are giving to God from every single small thing in their life. Like, for instance, they would make sure they go through the spice rack in their house. And if they bought, like I did yesterday, a new container of ground thyme, they would make sure that they take 10% of the new container of ground thyme and they would give it to the priests or the religious leaders for their use to make sure that they have flavorful food and that God's people don't just have to have bland food. I can imagine somebody next week is going to put in the offering basket little sacks of 10% of your spices. Knock yourself out. You see the problem. Jesus says, wow, you guys are paying attention to all those little details. And here's the issue. You're missing the big stuff. The stuff that really matters. The stuff that the Bible's really about. The stuff that's always been on God's heart. Jesus says those things are justice and mercy and faith. And you are so misdirected or preoccupied with all the small things that you're missing the big things. And worse yet, not only are you misdirected because of your role as leaders, you are misdirecting others. Now you can reflect with me if you want. Human religion of all kinds, done badly, looks like that. Can you think, for instance, um, one of the religions that is in the news a lot in our day and time in our country is Islam. And not Islam as practiced in this country. Islam as practiced in the Middle East. What have you seen and heard on the news about Islam in the more fundamentalist Muslim countries in the Middle East? 
does it not look like what Jesus said about the Jewish leaders back then? Heather and I have a family friend who lives in Jordan, which is a Muslim country in the Middle East. And this woman was accosted one time because she was wearing a dress that showed too much of her ankle and calf. And therefore, a Muslim man confronted her about showing too much skin. That dude would have a heart attack, by the way, in our country. And what she missed about that guy, what she wished that guy would have gotten is, wait a minute, you're walking around the streets of our city in Jordan and you're just looking for a woman to have her skirt a millimeter too high on her leg so that you can call it out and point it out. But what about the big stuff, like justice and mercy toward me if my skirt happens to be, or dress happens to be a little bit high? Or faith? Really? And sadly, I would suggest to you that even in our country where the predominant form of faith is Christianity, when it's done badly, it looks like this too. It looks like Christian people caring too much about little details that maybe to them are meaningful. That's fine. But they are small and meticulous and detailed, and in the end, they are lifeless. And we neglect things like justice and mercy and faith. I had the conversation with a pastor in the last couple of weeks whose church is wrestling with whether or not to start a building program. Namely, they need to do a church uh, addition. They need to build a second gym on their church. And what he's wrestling with is, wait a minute, I get that we think we need this, but how does this potentially distract all of us from the things that really matter, that we really should be about as a church family, like, in the words of Jesus in Matthew 23, justice and and mercy, and faith. And he's gravely concerned that this building addition that seems to be for the right reasons will ultimately swamp them and distract them for what really matters. This is what Jesus came to confront. This is why Jesus had to die. Somebody had to say, you guys have this all backward." You have flip-flopped or inverted the whole thing. This is not about little rules, most of which you made up yourself. This is about justice and mercy and faith and love, character and morality. This is what it always should have been about. These are the next two verses in Matthew chapter 23 that tell you more about why it was Jesus came to die And now he had to throw his very life against the system that was in place. And he knew that ultimately it would cause his own death. These are Jesus' words again. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisees, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside may also become clean. What's Jesus' problem with the system in place? The way of thinking about God and religion and spirituality in place in his day and time. And really it's a critique of how oftentimes human beings of all times and all places think about those same subjects. Well, the first half is clear enough. And again, Jesus thought it was clear enough it was worth his life. He'd had it with outward, superficial, four appearances spirituality. The outside of the cup in his simple image or metaphor. Apparently in his day and time, the spiritual leaders taught all those within their care that they should worry most about how they appear, or how they look, or how they sound to the other people around them, the outside of the cup. 
And oftentimes, this meant that they would ignore what was really going on inside of the cup. In Jesus' words, things like greed and self-indulgence, a complete lack of self-control. Religion done badly plays, pays more attention to the outside of the cup than the inside of the cup. Have you seen that too? Where people are taught to look and sound and behave in a way that makes them acceptable to the people around them, all the while ignoring real life change or heart change on the inside. Have you seen that? This is the system that Jesus came to break. What, what might that look like in your life? How have you seen yourself fall prey to that very kind of thinking? Paying more attention to the exterior or the outside than the interior or the inside of your life. We're going to talk about interior change in a moment because that's the system that Jesus came to put in place. But focus on the negative part of that first paying attention too much to the outside. Well, here's one of the more fundamental ways you can see it. Basically, a lack of integrity in your life. You know what the word integrity means? When the outside of you matches up with the inside and vice versa. Deep down at its most basic place, Jesus' problem with the system of the Pharisees is that it was, there was a lack of congruence between the outside and the inside. There was a lack of integrity. They were pretending to be somebody they were not. It was, in a word, inauthentic. They were teaching people to sound better or behave better or act better or go through all the hoops better than they really were on the inside. And they even went as far as to say, that's okay if, that, if that's how you imagine religion to be. That's okay if that's how you think God wants you to be. And Jesus says, no. No. Do you see that in the end, there is this fundamental break between who you are on the inside and who other people see on the outside? And human beings can't live that way. You can't leave, live disconnected between the two parts of you, what people see and what people don't. And Jesus thought enough of that that he thought it was worth his life. He had to call them out on the fact that what they were doing and how they went about it never really touched them on the inside, never really transformed them, never really changed them from the inside out. And that's because they were obsessed with appearances. They were obsessed with looking okay. They were obsessed with looking like they have it all together and were doing all the right things. How many times in your own life have you experienced religion gone bad in that very same way? How have you seen people oppressed by it, weighed down by it, broken by it, dispirited by it? I would suspect a lot. This is the flip side that Jesus came to put in place. He says, if you want to do it my way, you need to work on the inside of the cup first. And then, you know what? The outside of your life's going to follow. If you work on what's true inside of you, that will change your entire life, including what everybody sees. And you know people like this. The people you most admire in the Christian faith are probably people like this. People who seem to have something that's true or real about their lives that starts deep within them and seems to bubble up out of their lives. It breaks through the surface of their lives in most of the conversations they have, most of your interactions with them. You see it and you feel it. That's what Jesus is talking about. They live their life from their connection with God outward. They live their life from their transforming heart outward, and it cannot help affect every part of who they are. Jesus says, start with your heart. Start with the inside of the cup, and everything else will change. This was his new way of looking at faith 
and spirituality and God himself. And this is what he thought was worth his life. It was the system that he came to put in place while breaking the old one. How do you change your heart? This seems tough because so often, think about it, when we talk about sin or bad behavior in church, we often talk about specific actions, outward things. You have a problem lying. What's the advice you get? Well, stop. You have a problem overspending. Well, what's the advice you get? Stop. Make a budget. Stop. This seems to be all outside of the cup thinking. Yes? Now, I get it. There's merit to the idea of if you're a habitual liar or you habitually lose your temper or you say things you ultimately regret, trying to stop. I understand. How much lasting change have you been able to make in your life simply by focusing on stopping a behavior? As someone myself who struggles with specific behaviors, there have been times in my life where I have seen all kinds of impulses and compulsions eat me up. I overeat. I'm depressed. I get angry and nobody sees it because it's all on the inside, but my thinking and my words inside are so negative and so pessimistic. How is it that I or you break free from stuff like that? It's not my trying to stop the behavior. The most important thing we can do, according to Jesus, is change the inside of the cup. Work on changing your heart. What's true about you on the inside, the you that is private a lot of times, that nobody else sees, that God himself knows best, the you of your hopes and your loves and your dreams and your values and your priorities that none of us are 100% good at living out. That person, your mind, your heart, your soul, you change those things. And how do you do that exactly? You admit, here are some biblical answers, then we're going to talk about Jesus' answers. Here are some biblical answers. You admit that you're in, you are powerless uh, to change your own heart. And you start by acknowledging that only God himself can work on changing how you feel, how you think, and what you value. You admit that you're powerless, and you ask God to intervene and to help you do that. You know that, again, biblically speaking, from the broader context of the 66 books in your Bible, you know that you need to be dependent on God. You're asking him to take you places that you have not yet been, to do change in your life that you have not yet seen. And so you exercise faith saying, God, I will let you move me and push me and direct me in ways that I can't even imagine yet. But I lean on you and depend on you and I will trust you to do that. Seems like one of those big things, by the way, that Jesus mentioned in the last two verses we looked at, right? Justice and mercy and faith. Here's some things that Jesus himself says about changing your heart. You want to change your heart? Change your treasure. This comes from the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, verse 21 of Matthew. You want to change your heart, change your treasure. So one of the simple things you could do is begin to change one or two of the things in your life that you care the most about. Find some things in your life that maybe weren't all, aren't worth your time, energy, attention, and passion as much as you think and switch it to something that is. Like caring for somebody else, serving somebody else, encouraging somebody else. Make that a treasure of your heart. Instead of all of the silly stresses that you and I tend to put in the place of treasure in our life. So your house doesn't get repainted for the next six months. Maybe that's okay. If there are greater treasures that you should care about in your heart. You see that? Here's another one that Jesus himself says. Forgiveness is good for your heart. Jesus says that we ought to forgive one another from the heart. And in so doing, as we forgive from the heart, that very act changes who we are on the inside. He also speaks to why that is. Because people who forgive are able to be forgiven. The, most, the people that you know in your life who are the most gracious, 
and patient and merciful to others are those who experience that from God himself in their own life. And so he says, here, try something. It may not be easy, but try something. You want to change your heart? Forgive somebody. Forgive somebody who has hurt you or legitimately deserves your disdain for what they've said to you or done to you. Forgive them. Take the first step of saying, I forgive you. You may not even ever say it to their face. You just say it between you and God and nobody else. I release you. I forgive you. I want God to do in your life what I want Him to do in my life. I want God's best for you the same way that I want God's best for me. And as you do this one specific thing, you will find your heart freed, liberated. You will find your heart changing. You will find yourself experiencing God's own forgiveness of you, and you will find your own ability to forgive others expanding. Your heart will change. The inside of your cup will become clean. The system that Jesus came to put in place has much more to do with how you conduct yourself and manage yourself on the inside than on the outside. Because the only way you're ever really going to change, or better said, the only way God's ever really going to be able to change you is for you to put the attention there. This is the system that Jesus came to put in place. Why did Jesus die? Here is one of the Bible's answers to that. One that you will see in spades in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus died because he was on a collision course with the powers that be. The usual way of thinking about God and faith and religion and spirituality. And he knew that it was going to cost his life to break that system. Here's what uh, one Christian thinker and writer of our day says about this particular part or message of the death of Jesus. This is a guy named James Bronson. He writes, The message of Jesus' death, or the cross, means that the church, us, his followers, is, in, a very, fun, in very fundamental ways, a community that radically calls into question the accepted status quo. The message of Jesus' death, or his cross, jars us as Christian people loose from our normal assumptions and expectations. His cross shatters our conventional understanding of what it means to love and to live well. It calls us to a profoundly different kind of life. Loving, trusting, and risking more deeply than we otherwise would have thought possible. There it is for you and I who follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Jesus came to obliterate a system and to point a new way forward. This is why sometimes it feels so hard for you and I as Christian people, even 20 centuries later, to walk in a distinctly Christian way that is different from the world and the people around us. And the message of the cross to you is, it may cost you. It may cost you to try to live Jesus' way, to see things Jesus' way, to do things Jesus' way. But like him, I hope you can see that it's worth it. To confront, stand up against, and ultimately triumph over the system that surrounds you Would you take a moment or two here at the end of the message? And I'd like you to uh, give God a moment or two to speak to you about what you heard today, about the meaning of the death of Jesus and how Jesus himself came through his death to break our usual ways of thinking about religion and spirituality and God. Maybe even ask God who it is in your life this week that may need to hear about this liberating message of Jesus' death.
and life. Take a moment in the quiet, pray about those things on the screen, and then I will pray for us all.